So every uh, couple of months or so, we get together and we look at the worship series that are coming up and uh, pick music for it. And uh, when we sat down um, a couple of weeks ago, um, Kimberly and Karen and I, to pick music for the next few weeks, um, they got started before me because uh, I was a little bit late to the party. When I joined, they just looked at me like, what on earth? are you going to do with all of this? And I'm like, oh, just you wait. There's a lot of good news in there. Um, so this week we are starting our uh, worship series on the book of Esther. Um, and if you want to follow along, we actually put up um, a page on our website, um, and it's also in our app um, that kind of talks about the series and gives the chapters we will be talking about. Um, we won't read the whole chapters on Sunday mornings because as you just heard, there's a lot of names in this, um, and it's a little cruel to do what we just did to Kermit. Um, and make him read all those names. Uh, and, uh, but we followed along with that. The other thing that we did, so you know, is you, we, if you're here in person, there's printouts. If you're online or whatever, they're on the phone too. We actually gave you a little sheet sheet of who everybody is, at least the important characters. Um, so if you want to keep track of who's who um, as we go through this, you can grab one of these sheets on the way out or get it on our website. Um, and it runs through at least who the important folks are in the book. Um, Today's scripture really is the chapter that sort of sets up everything that's about to happen. You may have noticed that even though this is the book of Esther, Esther's not actually in the first chapter. She'll show up next week. Um, and another important character, Mordecai, uh, who we'll be talking about a lot, isn't in this chapter. He's going to show up next week. This one sort of sets the stage and is really important to help understand the context of everything that's about to happen. Um, and one of the things, uh, there's a couple unique things about the book of Esther. One um, is the book of Esther had a really hard time. Uh, and it was one of those books that was really debated whether or not it was actually going to get included or in the Bible or not. Um, when they were uh, deciding what was going to be in the Old Testament and not in the Old Testament, this book was hotly debated. Uh, when the Christians got together in the third century to decide um, what it is that we were going to have in our book and not in our book, um, oftentimes we think about that as the time we put together all the books that we would know as the New Testament. But they went back and they talked about the Old Testament and what book should be in and what book should not be in. Um, and Esther is one that gets debated a lot um, and yet managed to get in, um, and you will find it in most of your editions, or all of them, really. The re one of the reasons why is the, the, a lot of unique attributes to this book. Esther, even though she gets her own book and is a big character in her own book, the characters in this book are not referenced anywhere else in the Bible. You will not find any other references to Esther anywhere else in the Bible, um, unlike the other kind of uh, similar books like the book of Ruth um, or the book of Jonah um, or whatever. You will find references to those people in other places. You will not find any references to Esther anywhere else. This one really stands alone um, on its own, uh, but it does provide a couple of important things. One, um, maybe not so important to us, uh, but one of the festivals in the Hebrew calendar is the festival of Purim, um, and Purim is a festival directly related to this story. Because uh, one of the things that's going to happen, one of the places we're going to go, um, is that God's people are going to be put under threat and Esther um, and Mordecai have to come together and save them. So one of the ways that um, in the Jewish tradition, the Hebrew tradition, that they remember their saving um, is through this festival, similar to the festival of Passover, like we, we talked about a couple weeks ago with Easter. Um, so there's another festival that you've probably not heard of called Purim that apparently has some really tasty treats associated with it. Um, that's all I've ever heard about it from people, <laughs> even from my friends who are Jewish. Like, yeah, Purim, we get those really tasty little bread treats. And I'm like, Great, um, but uh, but it's it celebrates this. So this is the and it's the reason why we kept, this story was kept around um, was it explains why that festival exists. Now this is one of those things that takes place during 
the Babylonian exile. And we've talked about the Babylonian exile a lot uh, in various times in this church uh, because it was a really important thing in the life um, of God's people at that time, and it happened in the 5th and 6th century BC. Um, And at that time, God's people were not in the land that they had been promised, or at least not all of them were. A good number of them were taken out, and they were scattered throughout um, kind of the Middle Eastern area. And this is a story that takes place during that time. And that's something that's important to remember, um, is God's people are alone. They are a small group amongst a vast empire that is not theirs. Um, And they are trying throughout that time to figure out how to keep their identity and keep who they are um, as part of, despite being a very small number amongst a vast majority. Now, a couple other things that come um, in this book that make it interesting that I'll invite you to pay attention to as we read along. As always, there are things that are interesting because of their omission. One of the things that doesn't happen in the book of Esther is a lot of what we would call like religious stuff, right? God does not come up much at all. Nobody really prays. Um, You know, it's quite clear throughout it that Esther isn't actually keeping kosher and doing all those things you would expect somebody to do. Um, and, uh, And instead, it just continues, it mostly focuses on her and her story through this. Um, and again, that's another reason why people have, you know, the people have kind of questioned this book. And then finally, the last thing to, 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 to keep in mind is that the version that we have in our Bibles, um, that we always have is, that is almost always in the Christian Bible is the oldest version. It's the version, it's the original version. It was the version that appeared in Hebrew. Um, and it's the version that we keep. There are other versions Um, If you have like a study Bible that includes what's known as the Apocrypha, if you have the Apocrypha, you will find in there the Greek additions to the story. And one of the things that the additions add is a lot more God. (laughs) So somewhere along the way, they're like, gosh, there really should be some more God in this book of the Bible. Um, And and so somebody went in and added those back, added some some sections um, about that, added to the history that is presented in this story. Um, So if you go like to a Bible thing and you type in Esther, you might find also the additions to Esther, uh, which are Greek additions that were added later because somebody just simply couldn't stand the fact that there wasn't enough God in the story, which I kind of get. Okay. So that kind of lays the groundwork for where we are. So that's tough tough to keep in mind the whole time. So we're here in this land. We're in an empire that is vast. We're in the Persian Empire, uh, which for its day was the biggest empire going. It rivaled Rome, or it it rivals the size that Rome would become later on. Um, As you can see, it it stretches all the way from India to Turkey. Um, You know, they really kind of ran into Greece and the the Greeks, and kind of that's about as far as they could get. Um, There's actually some really um, amazing Greek um, stories and, and mythology around their wars with the Persian Empire. The Vision Empire was huge. It was vast. Um, it was wealthy. Uh, it controlled most of the trade routes of the day. Um, and because of that, they had a lot and they were the biggest thing going. They were the closest thing to a superpower you would find at the time. So that's the place where we find ourselves. And so we find ourselves in this court Right? I think I described this in the intro video that uh, one of the things that uh, Esther really is is it's the Downton Abbey of 6th century BC. Uh, and we do kind of find ourselves, and a lot of it takes place as this kind of royal intrigue. Well, this is what the king is king of, this vast, huge, wealthy um, kingdom. And because it is vast and huge and wealthy, uh, we are told in chapter one that he decides to put on a time of splendor and pomp. Basically, the king decides he's just going to show off the great wealth of his empire um, to anybody and everybody who might be around, and he's going to do this for 180 days. 180 days of partying, even in my college days. I'm not sure I could have hung for 180 days. And then he gets to the end of the 180 days of the pomp and the circumstances and showing off this is how wealthy and special we are. He says, you know what would really top all this off? Let's have a banquet 
that everybody can go to, which sounds great, and let's let that last a week, right? And so that's what he does. He throws this banquet for an entire week. And as would have been custom at the time, um, the men and women would have probably ate together and then separated uh, once the drinking started. And drinking actually is a big part of this story. um, And it's one of the things that leads to the first problem. So the men and women separate, which is why the king and the queen are not together. Um, They separate when the party really gets going. Um, And the guys are over here. And there's this really interesting line um, about how the king had given this special decree that everyone was welcome to consume as much as they wished um, in terms of the alcohol in the drinking, uh, because it would have actually been the custom of the time uh, that you were expected to match drink for drink whatever the king was doing. So if the king was not enjoying himself, you didn't get to enjoy yourself. If the king was really enjoying yourself, you didn't have a choice. You really had to. Um, and he decided to, like, no, no, for this time, do whatever you want, have as much fun as you want. And this goes on for seven days. Man, it must, not, it must be nice that all the other problems of the world were solved, right? There apparently are no other concerns in this kingdom. Nothing of interest is going on um, that we can take 180 days just to goof off and then we can cap it off with a seven-day drunken kager. Because that's what happened. The Bible said so. I, I judge it if you want. Um, so what does this tell us? It tells us a couple of things. Um, one is this king is not somebody we're really supposed to respect or look up to, right? He's from another place. He's not part of God's people. Um, He's obviously participated in the taking of the Jews out of their land. Um, He's enslaved some. He is not somebody we're really supposed to be looking up to. So when we look at him and go, well, geez, why did he do that? I'm like, because he's an idiot, and clearly we know that, (laughs) because the Bible says so. All right. Uh, the final thing that's in the introduction that if you go and read the whole thing that we kind of skipped is there's actually verse after verse after verse talking about um, things like the draperies and how splendid the place was. Now, we've talked about this before, too. Ink was expensive. All this stuff was expensive. You didn't write a detail down unless it was important, and yet it's very uncharacteristic for there to be this many details um, about things like the location and what's going on and describing the scenery other than the fact that we're really supposed to know um, from that is that these people were very wealthy and they decided to put their wealth on display. At least the people in charge were. So at the end of the seven days, after the 180 days, the king gets an idea, which is great. All your best ideas come after seven days of straight drinking. (laughs) And he sends for his wife, the queen, and he says, Make, bring the queen here, um, even though at this point they're supposed to be separate. It's like, bring the queen here so basically I can show her off to all these other people. Now, um, over time, there's been speculation as how we are to read the line. It says, have her come here wearing her crown was the line. Now, the language is a little ambiguous. It's been translated in a couple of different ways. And one of the things that rabbis and different scholars have done throughout the, the, um, the way have debated whether that actually should be read, have her come wearing her crown, or it should be read, have her come wearing only her crown, which would kind of give you a reason why she didn't do it, right? <laughs> but for whatever reason, she decides not to give in to this drunken request of her husband um, and go and go and join in, uh, in that side of the party, which apparently causes a little bit of a crisis. And I love this crisis. This is hilarious. <laughs> because, again, interesting, conspicuous by its absence is what is the response when the eunuchs come back and they say, no, she doesn't want to do it. Does anybody ask any kind of question like, I don't know, why? Why does she not want to do it? Does anybody go back and say, um, what's up? Does the king go, go, go to her? None of that happens. What happens is, of course, what happens is all the men in charge fall into a tizzy and decide, oh my gosh, if the queen is allowed to do this, then none of our wives are going to respect us either. To which I have to stay, if that's all it takes for your wife not to respect you anymore... 
is for her to have permission not to, there's something else wrong here uh, between you and the relationship between you and your wife. Um, but they fall, and they really kind of fall into this like problem at this, again, they fall into this tizzy about, oh my gosh, what will this mean? People will find out, people will gossip, and of course it's true, um, you know, I mean, it's similar to, you know, uh, how people gossip about the royals today. We don't have royals here, but in England, I hear it's a big thing. People still gossip about those people. I don't know why. I couldn't tell you their names if I wanted to, but I hear people care. Well, people really cared back then because, frankly, they didn't have reality television like we have. So there wasn't as much to entertain them. So they like to hear stories about what's going on. And they're not wrong. He's not wrong. It, word probably would have traveled um, that, that the queen had done this. Um, but their response to it is to do what? To basically, in a way, in that weird sort of logic that we can use sometimes, their response to the queen is to basically give her what she wants because now she never has to go to the king again, right? I'm like, you refuse to do this. Now you forever must do the, not do the thing you refuse to do. And I'm like, thanks, right? Uh, I think. Uh, the interesting, the most important part about that part though, and this is foreshadowing for what's coming, is this line. When the, when, the, when the advisors basically come back and the king's like, what am I supposed to do now? My wife's not paying attention to me. And they say, if it pleases the king, let a royal order go out for him and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes so that it may not be altered that Vishti never again come before the king. So that it may not be altered. They want the king to do something that he himself then would be able to go and take back. Basically, make a rule that can never be amended or changed, even by you. Now, this is, in this part, we're going to see where that happens, and it has a small consequence. I will give you a little bit of a spoiler for what's coming. This is going to come up again, and it's going to lead to a much bigger problem. One of the things that we take from this whole story and that will be a theme throughout, is doing things or putting yourself in a place where you do something that can never be taken back or changed oftentimes leads to more problems. The king right here is going to create a small problem for himself, and eventually, by doing the same thing and by being that inflexible, he's going to make even a bigger problem down the road. And so we have in this section kind of an introduction not just to the characters, but the introduction to the, who these kind of people are. And one of the things that we understand about who these people are, in the face of what is honestly a pretty small problem, the queen didn't want to come over and visit her drunken husband, they really overreact, and they overreact in a way that they cannot or later will not be able to take back instead of doing what I hope most of us would think to do, which is at least before you jump to banishing people or setting up hard and fast things, asking the question, why didn't she want to come? Most of the pain and turmoil and everything that's going to follow after in this story could have been avoided if the king had done something a little bit different than what he did. And the thing that he could have done is got even just a little bit curious about what was going on with his wife and why she did the thing she did. The truth is, flexibility, the ability to be open to the God's movement, open to God's spirit, to have open minds and hearts that things may not always be the same tomorrow as they are today, is an important trait, and it's a trait that people of faith are called to have. Because if we just could know or pretend that we know exactly how things are going to go and exactly where things are going to go, then we really wouldn't need faith, would we? The reason we have faith is that we don't always know what's going on. We don't always know where things are going to go. We don't always know how things are going to work out. And the more that we try to put up walls 
to force things to go a certain way, oftentimes the thing that we are keeping out more than anything is that important thing that we talk about a lot, that important thing like the movement of the Holy Spirit. The truth is, being flexible is a good thing. And we know this from a lot of other places. Now, a few year, several years ago, 100 years ago or so, um, there were earthquakes. Earthquakes happen all the time. And it was just taken for a given for a long time that earthquakes just happen and they knock buildings down and then you put them back up again. But a while ago, a bunch of people started to ask questions about, I wonder why, when this earthquake happened, that building fell down and that one didn't. And they started to get asked questions and get curious about, like, why did this one fall down and that one not? And over time, we started to figure out there were some common traits amongst buildings that fell down versus buildings that didn't fall down. Um, and we came up with ways of actually dealing with building buildings so they'd be a little more resistant to earthquakes. And one of the ways that we make buildings more resistant to earthquakes is we make them more flexible, both the building itself and what the building stands on. Now, uh, before, before, before I wanted to be a pastor, I was a software engineer. Before I wanted to be a software engineer, I wanted to be an engineer. And before I wanted to be an engineer, I wanted to be an architect. I've wanted to be a lot of things. Uh, but I'm fascinated by architecture. Um, and I love, inter you know, interesting solutions to things. So this is, um, this, is a, this is what's called a base isolator. There it is. And what this is, is it's basically a giant rubber bushing like you might have in the suspension of your car that is holding up a building. And this is one of the ways that they actually architect buildings um, against and make more to be more resistant to earthquakes is they make sure they understand is one of the things you understand is that the earth is going to move whether you want it to or not eventually if you live in the right part of the world it's going to happen uh, the question is only what are you going to do about it so what this does is it isolates most of the building from the foundation with something that is at least a little bit flexible lets it move a little bit under very hard loads. Now, you and I can sit there and push on that all day long, and of course, it's not going to move at all. Um, it takes something with the force of an earthquake for that thing to be used. Uh, but we've come up with all sorts of ingenious systems just to put that little bit of flexibility, that little bit of movement, that little bit of fail-safe into our buildings um, so that they can maintain that flexibility um, just enough to give them a fighting chance um, should the earthquake and when the earthquake strikes. This building has a superpower to resist earthquakes, and its superpower is its flexibility. We have talked before here that each of us has a similar superpower, and that superpower is our flexibility, but oftentimes how that manifests is, is our curiosity. When we choose to be curious about something we don't understand first, before we choose to get angry about it, we are exercising our superpower. Now, that does not mean that when we investigate something and curious about it, we won't find reasons to actually be mad. There are times when anger is the appropriate response. Don't get me wrong. But the problem the king has is his first response is to get angry and act out of his anger. The story would be very different if his first response was to get curious and ask his queen why. Years ago, we started um, a ministry at my uh, church uh, before, um, which is a free store ministry, which we talked about a lot. Um, and it's a place that it's basically like, you know, it's a food bank without food. It's clothing, household items, those sorts of things. Uh, and a small group in our church really got excited about this idea. They heard about it and they really wanted to start one because unlike this church where we can't ever seem to find enough space for stuff, that church, we had plenty of space and nothing to do with it. Um, so this is what they wanted to do with it. And I remember early on, there were a few people who weren't too sure that this was a good idea for us to do, um, and were willing to let others go ahead and try it if they wanted to, uh, and, and, uh, but they were pretty certain it wasn't going to work, and it, wasn't, it was going to fail, and, uh, and, or that it was going right, to bring the wrong kind of people into the building, whoever those are, um, or all those objections that we have for those things to happen. And I remember one gal in specifically, uh, I'm going to call her April, that was not her name. This is like Dragnet, the names have been protect, changed to protect the innocent. <laughs> Which is an old reference that like only half of you are going to get, right? Most of you are just, um, you know. 
But she was one who started asking, you know, who, who was very clearly not happy about this idea, did not want to see it happen, um, and uh, would come and talk to me about it and, and just be like, well, I'm worried about this, or I'm worried about this. And I would try to explain to her, like, well, this is how it's going to work. I think it's going to be okay. Uh, worst case is it doesn't work. We'll just, you know. Um, and over time, it, it opened up, and, and we got to know, you know, it opened up, and the ministry grew um, over time. And eventually what I noticed after about, the store had been open for about six months, um, April came to volunteer, and I'd never seen her volunteer there before. Um, and I said, "Oh, hey, it's it's good to see you. I'm not sure. I've, I mean, you're are you okay?" And she's like, "Yeah, I just wanted to volunteer. I, I needed to see how this thing works." I'm like, okay, that's great. Um, so she went. And she volunteered. She hung some clothes, and then she left. And then I didn't see her there for a while. And then about a couple months later, she came back and she did it again. And then she left. And then she came and she's like, "So." I just want to know, like, where do all these people come from that are here? I'm like, um, around town? I don't know. And because we, we didn't ask a lot of questions. We're like, if you wanted stuff, we gave you stuff. Like, there was plenty of stuff. Here's the secret about the world. There's plenty of stuff, right? I have a pile of my stuff waiting for the rummage sale in the garage. I don't know where it came from. I think it multiplied in my house, right? There's plenty of stuff. If you invite people to say, hey, give us your stuff and we'll give it away for you, people love it. There's plenty of stuff. Um, so we just say, hey, come take stuff. And, she would, and she's like, okay. And she asked me again, I said, well, I'm not sure, you know, but if you want, you, you should ask them. You could talk to them. Um, you know, talk to folks. Um, you know, there's always one person kind of down in the waiting area. We didn't have enough room to let everybody up at once. There's always a down in the waiting area. Do you want to be the hostess down there? And you, you know, well, that was a role. And you can talk to folks. I'm like, sure. And she said, sure. And so she did that for a couple of weeks. And then she came into my office. And she's like, how's it going? I said, well, I just need to let you know, I met this woman um, at the free store. I said, yeah. It's like, she's got uh, three kids. Her husband, uh, she had to leave her husband because he was abusive. Um, he was an alcoholic. And uh, they got this far. They were in another part of Montana, so they got this far. That's when they ran out of money and gas. And so they've been living in their car and uh, they were trying to get their kid registered for school and do all the things that you do and find a place to be, and she had a job interview. And uh, so she was telling me, like, that's why they were there. Like, she's like, she needed, she needed clothes for an interview. Her kids needed clothes for school. And I'm like, oh, okay. So I, 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 I went up, and I helped her shop, and we, we left, and and all that kind of stuff, and, and uh, she's like, so we found them, we found, we had, they, we, sent, we somehow had kids, cl kids in our kid, clothes in our kids' side, which is kind of hard, kids wear out their clothes, um, and then they had um, something for her to wear, and they got her nice, one of the other volunteers got together and got her nice outfit put together for this interview, and, and all that kind of stuff, and I'm like, oh, that sounds great, she's like, yeah, she's like, I know, I know why we did this now, I'm like, yeah, that's why, She's like, are, and, uh, and she's like, are all the stories like that? And I said, no, they're not all. Some of them are like that. Some of them are smaller. Some of them are just people who are looking for a good deal. It's like they, people come from all kinds of places. But, but that's definitely one of the stories and many of the stories. And, um, and at least until for the rest of the time that I was at that church, April was there. And April was the hostess downstairs, getting to know people, meeting people and telling me, and learning their stories, and thankfully telling them to me, so that I could share them with the church. April was originally mad, and annoyed, and angry, and somewhere on the way, decided to get curious. And when she decided to get curious, she learned something she didn't know. She met somebody she never would have met. And I would say, from my perspective, God moved in her life, and the Holy Spirit moved in her life, in a way she had not had before. When we're open, when we get curious, things like that can happen. It does not mean they're always going to happen. But what is true is that if we don't ever get curious, if we don't really open ourselves up, if we already assume we know everything we need to know, I can promise you something. They're not going to happen. The Spirit won't be able to move in that way. And sometimes this happens in big ways. Sometimes we learn big, important things about life or each other and all that.
And sometimes this happens in small ways. Sometimes it just happens in little teeny ways where we assume we know what's going on and then the reality is something a little bit different. So let me end with this one. A story about a lawnmower. Now, my wife is an only child. And because my wife is an only child, even though she's a girl, she learned how to mow the lawn, right? As I have promised my daughter that when my son is too old or moves out of the house, my daughter will learn how to mow the lawn, right? Uh, Because that's the kind of liberated world we live in in the 21st century. Everyone can cut the grass but me. All right. Um, Why else do you have kids? I'm telling you. Um, And Dane, for years, mowed a lawn with a lawnmower that I believe was purchased used in the first place, um, and over time had been repaired, shall we say, lovingly, uh, with like a coffee can, I think, replaced part of the the, the center section, and uh, the bag was held on by vice grips and and all this stuff, and it didn't really start all that well or often. Um, And Dane would complain about this to her dad, and be like, you know, this lawnmower really isn't doing very well, and he's like, like, and, and he would continually insist, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. Look how nice the grass is, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. So for her entire growing up years, she mowed the lawn with all this lawnmower that was being held together literally by, you know, bailing twine and duct tape. And then what happened is what happens, which is, you know, kids grow up and they go and they leave and they go to school. And so Dane left and she went to school. And I don't know how long you were there. It wasn't long, maybe like a month. Uh, She comes in. It was like two weeks. She gets this phone call from her mom. She's like, yeah, your dad just bought a new lawnmower. (laughs) And we get this picture. And here's my father-in-law. God bless his soul. I miss him dearly. Um, With the two lawnmowers sitting next to him. As proud as anything can be. And what you can't see kind of really well is on the picture of the old lawnmower. There's a sign where he has written Dane's Lawnmower. And suddenly, though, he got very sympathetic for how annoying and how troubling this lawnmower was to use. And it's one of those things that has become kind of a fun story in our house and one of those things that we teased Dan about uh, when he was still with us and we still think about in some ways fondly. But no doubt, part of her at the time and even today was sort of like, really, you couldn't have just like a year earlier? Like, really? Really? Could, you couldn't have gotten a little curious about how blah, bad the lawnmower was? And I think in his own weird way, there was a small apology as much as he was able to do that um, for not listening to his daughter and not realizing how bad that it was. Um, and even though it was a joke and kind of became a joke, there was a sense, there was a sense, I always thought there was a little bit of a sense of when we would talk about it, he's like, yeah, I know, I probably should have done that sooner. Sometimes our need to get curious is about big stuff. Sometimes it's about small stuff. Sometimes it's about, um, you know, how we are and how we treat others. Sometimes it's how we treat the people in our house. Sometimes the thing we need to get curious about is where is God and what is God doing in this time and this place. That is our superpower. That is the thing that puts us in a place to know and experience the movement of God and the Holy Spirit because I got to tell you, God is often doing unexpected things. The story that we're about to dig into and read through um, and kind of live in the next few weeks is one where people will constantly not do that and the trouble that comes from it. So I think the lesson we ought to take right here from the beginning, the lesson that we ought to take right here from chapter one is when we encounter something we don't understand, when we encounter something that we're not sure about, when we encounter something that seems to go against the grain as far as we're concerned, perhaps the first thing we should do is not get angry or not get upset. The first thing we should do is get curious because there might be a reason why. There might be a reason we don't understand. We don't actually know why Vashti didn't want to go. We don't know if it was a good reason or not a good reason. For all we know is it wasn't a good reason. And the truth is, we'll never know. And we won't know because they chose, the king chose, her husband chose, instead of being curious to just get angry and lash out. I think that's our calling and our challenge as people of faith. People who know and trust that God is at work and moving in the world 
is to constantly ask ourselves those questions in those places, especially in those places that we don't always understand completely what is going on, is, is God working in this? Is there something I'm missing? Sometimes there will be things to legitimately be angry about. But then at least we know, we know then that that anger is justified. We don't know if the king's is, and what we do know is that he's about to create for himself a lot of problems. And we will discover those in the chapters and the weeks to come. I'm looking forward to this together. I do invite you um, to read ahead. Next week we will be doing chapter two um, together. I do invite you to do that. And look for those places. There's two things to be looking for. Where, where in this story could being curious have changed things? And two, what's interesting because it's missing? A lot of what's most interesting and fascinating about this story is for what doesn't happen and isn't there than what is. Amen.